All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm just glad that uh, our panel is not standing you, estimate between you and, and lunch. There's one more panel after, after this. Uh, but, but clearly, I think all, all the speakers uh, that have uh, speakers and panels, they have alluded to climate, energy, sustainability in one way, shape, or form. Um, but we're going to kind of exclusively focus on climate resilience and how um, city governments, county governments, other agencies, federal agencies are uh, looking at it, taking action, uh, so we can all learn from their uh, efforts and learn how to work with them or learn, learn from their examples. So my name is uh, Addy Ranade, and I'm managing partner with uh, Two Degrees Adapt. Uh, our mission is making climate resilience actionable through the use of data and science. And um, we comprise of a team of atmospheric scientists, uh, infrastructure technology experts across energy, food, and water, and finance and uh, insurance. And uh, I'm very lucky to have uh, a very qualified panel here. Um, I'll start from, uh, from my left-hand side, Shakina Perry uh, at uh, Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago. Then Anna Isabel Mendoza from uh, McLean County of uh, Regional Planning Commission. Uh, then John Hortness from US Geological Survey. And uh, last but not the least, uh, Evie Bauman uh, at City of South Bend. Uh, so what, what we're going to do is um, introduce ourselves uh, in more detail about who we are, what we do, um, and then get into the details of how to define climate resilience examples of projects that uh, these individuals and their organizations are engaged in. It may be generating data, sharing data, or actual on the ground projects. Uh, and then I have a list of prepared questions uh, and uh, that, that deal with everything from innovation, if, uh, if Dave is here, <laughs> uh, financing hurdles, other types of hurdles, um, use of future climate projections, uh, and then balancing mitigation and adaptation. And then we may have, may have time for one or two audience questions. So really looking forward to it. So let's start with some introductions. Uh, Shakina, would you like to introduce yourself and uh, tell us about your organization and, and your specific role? Uh, absolutely. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Commissioner Shakina Perry at the uh, Water Reclamation District. Uh, super excited to be here. Um, we are a, we do three main things. Uh, we keep our main public water source clean, which is Lake Michigan and our surrounding waterways. Uh, we treat and manage our wastewater and we do storm water management. Uh, we help residents throughout Cook County uh, with all of these different issues. Um, and as a commissioner, we handle two primary things, although we have um, tons of staff. We have nearly 2,000 employees. Um, at our water reclamation plants, our pumping stations, at our district office, to handle an array of things. Um, but me in particular and my colleagues, there are nine of us, uh, we uh, oversee our budget. So we do pr fiscal oversight um, with a $1.4 billion budget, uh, figuring out what infrastructure projects do we want to fund and support, uh, what type of uh, capital improvement projects need to be made, what staff departmental support is needed, while at the same time updating our rules, regulation, and ordinances uh, to make sure that, you know, it uh, reflects our current time. Um, you know, we've been around for nearly 130 years, and a lot of things that worked back then don't work today. Um, so really making sure that we're um, working with staff, working with the community and stakeholders to make sure that our current policies reflect um, what our current needs are. Thank you all for having me. Thank you, Shakina. Uh, Anna, would you like to uh, tell us about uh, you, your organization, and maybe you know, a county government's perspective uh, in, uh, on climate. All right. Oh, there we go. Hi, everybody. My name is Anna, and I'm from the McLean County Regional Planning Commission. I am an assistant planner, and I know we had a show of hands earlier today. A couple of you guys are familiar with um, an MPO. Has anybody here by show of hands ever been to McLean County or worked in McLean County? 
okay, a handful of you guys, awesome. So um, McLean County, fun fact, is one of the largest um, counties in Illinois by land size. However, our population is about 171,000 with a large concentration in the town of Normal, city of Bloomington, village of Tawanda, village of Downs, and a lot of smaller rural communities sprinkled throughout. And as I learned myself recently, fun fact, 17 ghost towns, pretty interesting or spooky, however you look at it. Um, the role um, of the uh, McLean County Regional Planning Commission. So we handle a lot of projects um, dealing with transportation, but also a couple housing initiatives, regional plans. The most recent plan that we're working on is our Metropolitan Long Ridge Transportation Plan 2050. Bit of a mouthful, so shorten it to MLRTP 2050. So the goal of that plan is to identify goals related to transportation that we want to see through the year 2050. So whether that's safety, sustainability, um, different factors and highlight exactly how we're going to carry out those goals, specific goals by the year 2050, how we're going to measure our progress and how to keep ourselves um, accountable. We also um, have a travel demand model, so looks at where people are coming from, where people are going, what modes they use, and what is our transportation um, network going to look like a um, year from now, 5, 10, 15. And um, we also work with a lot of our local greenways, maintaining our parks, and yeah, we're um, all over the board. Right now, there's about seven, um, eight, once we find an intern of us. Um, and we, we definitely keep busy, but I'm excited to be here. So, uh, John, I think you're in a unique position here representing a federal agency, uh, not necessarily in charge of um, program management or, or disbursing money, but more uh, as, as a source of data, understanding, insight, information. So if you can introduce yourself, your role, and um, uh, uh, maybe later on I'll ask you about how uh, cities and counties should work with you to access the, the treasure trove of data that USGS uh, uh, develops. Yeah, great. Thanks, Addy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, so my name is John Hortness. I'm the uh, Great Lakes Program Coordinator for U.S. Geological Survey. And as noted, you know, so we are a federal agency. We're part of the Department of Interior. So national, you know, coverage of science and information across the country. And so we bring a pretty unique perspective. We are, uh, so you heard the Colonel talk earlier about the Corps of Engineers. We work closely with the Corps of Engineers on multiple efforts across the country. But he noted how the Corps is the nation's largest you know, infrastructure and construction entity in the country. And we are that uh, related to science and mapping. We are the nation's largest entity focusing on earth science, water, biology. Um, think of us as kind of the, the inland version of NOAA. You're, really, you're probably all familiar with NOAA, National Weather Service, thinking about you know, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes. That's the type of information you get from them. Our focus, other than the earth sciences, volcanoes, earthquakes. So if you're in California, you're probably hearing about USGS related to earthquakes. If you're in the Northwest, you know, volcanoes. So that's the type of work we do across the country. Um, but then if you think about how that relates to climate, we, we have our folks, our engineers, our scientists, our researchers thinking about these big, broad societal issues like climate change and how we can provide that information to help inform a lot of the decisions you all are making in your day jobs on the things we talked about, have heard earlier and we'll hear later today related to infrastructure, planning, doing things more efficiently, doing things better. Our goal is to really provide that baseline understanding of the earth sciences, and in this case, really focused on you know, those climate uh, futures. What, what does the climate look like in the future? How does that play into the earth sciences and how can we give you the information to help you make better decisions? And that's really our mission in USGS is to provide that unbiased science to help society make those informed decisions to do things better, hopefully more efficient and uh, you know, help us advance moving forward. So um, I'll touch on a few of those things later in some of the other questions, but I think related to probably here in the Midwest, uh, you know, my focus is on the Great Lakes. And one of, the, one of the areas where we probably see the most obvious relationship between climate, potential uh, climate, you know, how climate is changing for the future, what potential climate scenarios look like, are on our Great Lakes coasts, kind of that water 
uh, coastal infra or, uh, interface is where we're really seeing some of those changes. Um, thinking about Great Lakes water levels, you know, here in Chicago, we've seen a lot of that here in Lake Michigan in the recent past. Um, but even expanding beyond that a little bit in other parts of the Midwest, thinking about flooding and how climate has an impact on the extremes like, uh, like major floods and how that impacts infrastructure just along even our river coasts. And, you know, we have a lot of big rivers in the upper Midwest. A lot of our cities were built along those rivers. And so that water infrastructure interface is really important when we start thinking about what the climate looks like down the road. So I think that's enough for now, Addy, but uh, thank you and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Great, thank you, John. Uh, and Evie, if you'd like to introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about the city of South Bend um, and uh, your organization. Sure, thank you. I'm Evie Bauman, Director of Sustainability for the City of South Bend, and excited to be here. Apologies for the late entry. I was having a great conversation about the South Shore Line, which took this morning to get here, and future expansion, single track, or double tracking. It's going to be a huge deal. Um, I am originally from Bloomington, Indiana, so really excited to be back in the state after working a little bit in New York City and coming back home during the pandemic. So the Office of Sustainability in South Bend uh, shifted from being within the Public Works Department uh, from its origin in 2015 to the Department of Community Investment last summer when I joined. So we view our mission as mobilizing the community to address the climate emergency. So we're very focused on implementing our 2019 Climate Action Plan, Carbon Neutral 2050, which again, it was stated, not good enough, but we're working on uh, all the initiatives outlined in that plan and hoping to update it soon in the future to even be more aggressive on those goals. So we are mobilizing the community to address the climate emergency. How we do that, uh, we illuminate ways to reduce the pollution that causes global warming. We support community partners and initiatives that are already existing in South Bend. And then we design, develop, and deliver uh, climate solutions that are um, put forward by our office directly. So we're really focused on mobilizing the community, like I said, less so on the internal city government operations, because that accounts for approximately 3% of our community's greenhouse gas emissions. So really want to make these pathways available to people in South Bend. So looking forward to talking about some of those initiatives. Great, thank you all. Uh, and I'll, I'll say a couple of words about uh, Two Degrees Adapt. So uh, two things that are we, that we are doing specifically in climate resilience. One is on the data side. So we have a service called Climate Data Science in which we uh, curate uh, an ensemble of climate models for, for a city or a group of cities or um, a set of uh, assets for a private sector client, projecting things like temperature, precipitation, and some calculated variables like days about 90 degrees Fahrenheit or total precipitation or 24 or 48 period. The idea is that you have a future climate lens on all the infrastructure design decisions uh, that you're undertaking. And then the, the second thing that we do is tracking innovation. Um, so we monitor about 500 companies across the world on uh, uh, all kinds of climate perils from wildfire, use, use of AI for wildfire mapping to uh, next generation of groundwater and stormwater sensors to next generation of materials uh, for passive cooling of uh, rooftops for uh, prevention against extreme heat or adaptation to extreme heat. So that's what we do at, at Two Degrees. Uh, which brings me to kind of uh, my uh, my first question. Um, if each of you can give some examples of recent projects that you have done that you're really proud of or that you think are illustrative that our audience can learn from, uh, let's let's start there. And uh, in the process of doing that, if you can also at the outset define climate resilience from your perspective, what is climate resilience to you? And then you can give some examples of projects. So I'll try to mix it up and start with Anna. All right, so um, I guess I'll start with what does climate resilience mean to me? Um, I'm sure many people have heard climate resilience defined as um, responding or preparing for um, hazards caused by climate change, but I would like to take it a step further and think of it more as an active approach rather than a reactionary approach. So not just disaster hit, what do we do now? But thinking ahead of, okay, this area is more prone to flooding, tornadoes, heat. What can we do now to m help mitigate the effects that people will 
um, feel now or in the future. Um, some project that McLean County has, um, we are really proud of our greenways. So we have, as I mentioned, um, larger um, rural, um, rural space, and we have several parks and natural areas that we are very proud of. So we not only inform the community, have a web page dedicated to showing where our greenways are, but also um, have tours, encourage people to visit, and educate the public on why these areas are important. Something else that um, the city of Bloomington has is um, cooling and heating stations for um, people outdoors. So it can be great for people who are walking around or tourists, but also those experiencing homelessness. And Excuse me. We have other projects um, in the future that we are looking to um, in incorporate as well. Especially um, Central Illinois can be pretty um, prone to flooding and heat events. So I'm looking into different areas on how to mitigate that. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Shakina, I think there are a number of impacts of uh, climate uh, on on the water sector from you know, impacts of these 1% precipitation events on the size for water treatment uh, for uh, municipal utilities to uh, obviously, you know, right, the potential to recover methane from wastewater and uh, mitigating climate that way. Uh, so huge uh, possibilities here. Can you uh, educate us on uh, what City of Chicago is doing in MWRD specifically uh, across these areas and, and others? work happening here all right um, so I think Anna did a really good job with um, climate resiliency um, I look at it in three big buckets environment equity and economy and so when we're looking at what ways can we anticipate those disruptions we're being proactive as Anna already mentioned um, so we have disproportionately impacted communities all throughout Cook County that have outdated infrastructure and we know that folks are on a level playing field. I grew up in the back of the yards, I lived in the Ashburn community, I now live in the southwest suburbs of Justice, and all three of these communities are on different parts of the city and in Cook County, and they all have a common thread, flooding. And so when we know this, and we have this information, and we've seen how, um, you know, Biden's administration has done a historic amount of inf uh, water infrastructure um, investments um, the past year or two, um, but we know that's not enough. But we do know that with this money that we have in hand, we can start targeting communities that have been left behind. So that's when we talk about building resiliency is not just for high income communities who have the capacity and the revenue to do these things. What about the low and moderate income communities as well and making sure they're prepared for everything that's coming next. Um, so that's from a client climate resiliency resiliency standpoint. Uh, we know that when there is large rainfall, um, one inch of rain across Cook County can cause 16 billion gallons of um, flooding um, of water uh, to be collected. We also know that multiple inches of rain over a 24-hour period in Cook County uh, not on, only overwhelms our sewer system, but it also overwhelms our combined sewer overflow, which puts pollutants back into our waterways. So it's important for us to actually have targeted um, initiatives. So whether it's from you know from a greenhouse gas perspective, and you know us staying um, with the Paris Climate Agreement and saying we're going to commit to reduce our greenhouse gases by 50% by 2025 to thinking about our more green infrastructure projects like permeable schoolyards and permeable alleys and uh, green green alleys and bioswells and rain gardens and actually getting the community involved and in providing free milkweed saplings or um, compost so they can also play a role in uh, water miti um, mitigation efforts as well. Um, but we're also thinking on the technological side. Uh, we have a program um, that we're piloting right now called, um, it's called uh, Anita Mox. It's a de-modification process that helps speed up our um, nitrogen, nitrogen, nitrogen gas uh, removal uh, process um, at our plants. So we're always thinking about innovative ways to make sure we help reduce our carbon footprint, um, look for more renewable resources. Uh, if you all don't know, if you have gardens or you know community nonprofits that have access to gardens, um, our EQ compost program is big. This is a way that we extract nutrients from our wastewater treatment pl plants because we know that this water shouldn't, everything doesn't need to be disposable. We can reuse it in a way that's tangible and can really have long-term impacts. So I think at least six of our water reclamation plants are a place where 
regular community folks from um, Cook County can go take a bucket, can go grab a bag and use this to help um, with flood mitigation in different areas. Um, and I think, I mean, that's a, some multiple things that we're doing. Um, and I think the last thing I'll mention, Stickney Water Reclamation Plant, globally known, um, our largest water reclamation plant here, uh, always thinking about ways to make, make sure Stickney moves more efficiently, efficient, efficiently um, moves more um, in a way, works smarter, not harder. Um, so we replace our Emhoff tanks um, at the Stickney plant and that's going to help us with uh, reducing our carbon emissions as well. Um, so always thinking about innovative ways um, that we can save taxpayer dollars and also protect our environment. Well, thank you, Shakina. It's a, a fascinating array from you know climate mitigation to resilience and uh, really across the board solutions. Um, I'm going to go to Evie next, and then you know come come to John. So uh, Evie, uh, what projects are you most most proud of uh, in South Bend? Sure, thank you. Um, I do want to give a quick shout out to some projects that our office is not directly involved with, but were mentioned earlier today. We are undergoing a street light LED retrofitting project this summer. So that's been very exciting being carried out by our Department of Public Works. And we also have alternative fuel vehicles in our fleet. We went big on CNG a few years ago too. So um, we're exploring electrification of the fleet, but those are just two community or city shout out projects I want to mention. But there are two projects that I want to highlight today that we're really excited about. And people at the South Bend table, raise your hand if you're from South Bend here today, come talk to them later. Um, the first project that I want to discuss is a program that we call EASY, the Energy Assistance and Solar Savings Initiative. Alex is the project manager for it. So ask any program specific questions to Alex sitting there at the South End table. Um, Easy is a pilot program that we launched in January. We are using American Rescue Plan funds to give matching grants and offer optional low interest loans to community nonprofit organizations in South Bend to do energy efficiency projects and go solar. So through this program, we partnered with IFF. I believe they have a headquarters here in Chicago as well as in Indianapolis. And they are a CDFI uh, that helps nonprofits with their real estate management solutions. So we work with an architect there and their lending team to do an energy audit for community organizations in South Bend and then assess the most high impact energy efficiency projects and or solar projects that they could do. So we have 19 community organizations this year. We did a big push for this program because a policy called net metering was expiring in Indiana July 1st of this year. And we wanted uh, community organizations to know that they needed, if they had been considering solar at all in the past and made energy efficiency improvements to their building, now was the best time to take advantage of that one-to-one -one credit for excess energy that they put back onto the grid for the next 10 years. So we had five organizations sign solar contracts, over 400 kilowatts of solar that is going to be installed this fall. Many of them are using locally produced solar panels from a company called Crossroads Solar in South Bend. That company is a social enterprise that exclusively hires formerly incarcerated individuals. So it's been really great to work with them and bring their business into the community. And uh, through Easy, we've also just seen a lot of capacity development and growth in the nonprofit organizations. We've had a really great time visiting their facilities, seeing their various missions, and working together uh, to help them carry out these projects. So collaborating on which solar contractors they're working with, energy efficiency folks they're working with, projects they're doing, what other sustainability initiatives they're doing in their organizations, and building this uh, green community um, through South Bend. So we did this program also because nonprofits can't take advantage of that tax credit for solar. So trying to fill some of these gaps that might hold them back um, and also experiment with some financing in South Bend. Many organizations haven't taken on um, financing solutions for green energy uh, projects. So we're trying to kind of assess what the appetite is like there to be able to bring some more solutions to them. So uh, the second project that I want to highlight is also in collaboration with another colleague who's here today, Maddie. Her team has launched a program called Upskill SB, which is a workforce development training program, um, providing certifications, online certifications, training for in-demand, training for on-demand uh, certifications in 
Tech, as well as we advocated and partnered with them to bring a solar offering to that program. So we have six individuals in South Bend, many of whom work at Crossroads Solar, for example, who are going through online training from the Midwest Renewable Energy Association, MRIA, uh, to receive a baseline uh, solar industry certification. So we've been excited to see that workforce development opportunity come through. I want to speak to Elbert from IBEW because the union then approached us about this program and said, we're bidding on this huge project, Honeysuckle Solar Project in Northwest Indiana, and we'd like to hire all the folks that come out of your program. And that way, we're hoping if they're able to work on that project, might be good fits for the apprenticeship program and just really focused on creating that robust solar economy in South Bend. So um, all pilot programs, all right now funded by a lot of ARP dollars that we're really hoping to prove the concept and get them regularly appropriated. Great. Uh, thank you, Evie. So, so John, I think um, we at Two Degrees have benefited immensely from U.S. geological surveys, data, and science. Just to give a couple of examples outside the Midwest and Great Lakes, the basin characterization model for California really helped us analyze how agriculture in that state will change as a result of climate. Uh, same thing in you know, Kansas Water Science Center. Um, can you give some examples of uh, the type of data uh, related to climate resilience that USGS is uh, developing for Great Lakes Midwest region that, you know, cities, counties, uh, other government agencies can take advantage of as they plan their infrastructure. Yeah, thanks, Addy. So I'll start with a little bit uh, back to the kind of the climate resilience definition. And I'll, I'll touch on a couple things based on a couple of earlier comments related to flooding. And so some of the things our folks are really thinking about, um, so if you've heard the, the climate change conversation, you know, a lot of the researchers will talk about it's not just a global warming you know, temperature issue, it's also the result of that, which what we see in our climate or in our weather in a lot of cases are more extremes. You get higher highs and lower lows. And that's a lot of the things that we think about and, and talk about when we think about climate in the future and how to give folks like you the right information. Um, and that flooding specific example is thinking about how do we predict what water might look like 10, 20, 30 years from now. Like if you're planning for, you know, that one inch of rainfall across Cook County, what does that really mean? And, and someone mentioned, you know, the 1%, you know, we've kind of been ingrained in this, you know, 100 year flood, if you're thinking about, you know, planning for flooding in the future, designing for that. Um, but that's based on a, an understanding that there's a, and I'll get into, I can't, wouldn't be a scientist and an engineer and a, work for a science agency while touching on, you know, statistics for a second. So that's based on that, that normal probability that the past can inform the future. But with, with climate change, that's off the table. We don't have that ability to use what we've seen in the past to help predict what's gonna happen in the future. So that's really the struggle, and that's what our scientists are really thinking about, is how to look at these climate change scenarios and again, give you all that information whether it's related to flooding or in the Great Lakes specifically, higher and lower water levels. I think the Colonel mentioned that earlier, is you know, we're working closely with them on this climate or coastal resilience effort that the Corps of Engineers is leading. And it's both looking at what do we think the, the highs of the Great Lakes will look like in the future, but also the lows. And we look at, you know, that, that all that impacts infrastructure. All that impacts what you're going to do, how you're gonna plan, how you're gonna manage, how you're gonna maintain all those facilities in those coastal areas. Same thing with uh, our city infrastructure and understanding how will those bigger floods, more intense storms of the future change the way you have to manage, plan, build, all of those different uh, components of infrastructure. So we have folks working on those types of scenarios, those types of data. Uh, the data we collect, you know, and, and for those that aren't familiar with, uh, you know, we, we, a lot of earth science, water, biology data are available. All of our, you know, we're public, you know, public sector, we're the U.S. government, all of our data are available online. You have the ability to get that information at your fingertips through all of our web portals and, and data portals online. Um, if you think about just water, riverine systems, 
you know, daily data, hourly data on different rivers. Um, we work closely with the National Weather Service for flood forecasting. So when you get those warnings from National Weather Service that says, you know, you know uh, this Plains River here in Cook County is on the rise and we're expecting a, a flood peak, the data behind their forecast are USGS data that they use to determine where do they think the river will get to based on their modeling, taking advantage of our data. And I have, you know, there's hundreds of scenarios like that across the country where our data are kind of the base of these other, you know, other scenarios and other uh, modeling that others use to forecast other components. So I think the, the main message is that it's, it's more difficult and these are what our scientists are thinking about is, again, how to start thinking about those future scenarios knowing that we can't use the past to predict what we're likely to see in the future. It's a struggle. But we're, our folks are working on that, again, to give you that information to help you all make better decisions as, as you move forward. Thanks so much, John. I'll make a plug. Waterdata.usgs.gov, great place to start. Um, so I think through all of your work, you have kind of proven that this choice between mitigation and adaptation is a false choice. You're, you're all of you are doing both. So it's both and. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, the question that I would like to ask next is, what are some of the hurdles that, that you're facing? What, what did you wish was different? It may be you know, financing, data, innovation, any, anything, right? What did you, what did you wish you uh, had that you don't have right now that's a hurdle in your work? Uh, let's start with Anna. All right. So... I would say something that, I don't know if hurdle is the right way, but I think collaboration between not only the public sector, but private sector um, insurance companies is a really big, um, it's a really um, big key component. You can have the best climate resiliency flood mitigation plan in the world, but if you have pushback against real estate agencies, um, housing administration, other authorities, it's, you're gonna have a pretty um, tough time having the plan adopted. Another really big thing is education. So again, you can have the best um, plan in the world, but if you don't explain to the public, hey, this is why we're doing this, here's the science, here's the facts, here's the background, a lot of people don't react well to, hey, um, we know better than you, just trust us. You need to get the word out there and why, um, yeah, why this plan matters and why we're putting um, certain rules um, into place. Great. Uh, perhaps Shakina, next. Um, I think so. One thing that we've, we've identified gaps and hurdles and all those things over the years. Uh, we actually just put out a, a, a strategic plan um, that encompasses 2021 to 2025, uh, just really talking about five different pillars that address the multitude of things, um, but really to get over those hurdles. I think um, across Cook County, so many people, uh, so many municipalities own different parts of our sewer system. Um, so it's not just MWRD, municipalities, everything just looks different underground and who owns it and who has the jurisdiction over this, X, Y, and Z. Um, so when it comes to the collaboration process, um, that can get tricky. Um, and I think in addition to, uh, you know, make, actually having regional based approaches um, to how we address uh, stormwater management and flood mitigation is important because um, a municipality can say, hey, I want a rain garden here, um, but if we're not doing anything to address uh, flooding in the surrounding areas, that rain garden is, is not going to do as much as we it has the potential to do if we're not actually having conversations with those municipalities and creating regional based approaches. Um, and of course, you know, uh, funding is always a thing, right? I think um, when we talk about community engagement, um, I think uh, a lot of folks um, are paying out of pocket expenses for flooding. Um, the quality of life um, is affected because of flooding. Um, and then, you know, when people want, um, uh, solutions immediately, uh, these capital improvement projects, these uh, flood-based projects, whether it's green infrastructure or a stormwater management project, isn't created overnight. Um, there's so many uh, levels to actually making it happen. And so actually keeping the community uh, engaged and aware of like where we are in the planning process. Um, I mean, we have over 200 pro projects and 
process right now, whether it's in a design, design or construction phase, but making sure we're communi communicating that effectively, making sure folks have uh, community input um, so they know that we're you know, working hard to try to address those issues and um, not just leaving them out to dry. Um, no pun intended. So, uh, thank you. Thank you, Shakina. It's, it's a really tough problem, right? Um, so, John, from, from your perspective, um, what, what are the hurdles in uh, working with cities, counties, or what, what do you wish USGS would do better if only you had X? Yeah, so, so obviously, I, you know, I'm not going to call it a hurdle, but I think, you know, the reality of being a, a federal agency is, you know, we serve Congress, the administration, those priorities at any given time. So through our cycles, you know, sometimes those priorities change. And so maybe the, the one struggle is a, a consistent approach to certain topics. Um, I would say at a baseline, there are things that we do, we will continue to do, we always do. But then maybe the priorities tend to shift and maybe you spend more effort on certain things during one cycle than you might on another, et cetera. And so I think that's just a, that's just a reality of, of the way we work and, and who we are. Uh, but at the same time, and I'll, I'll go back to Addy, one of your notes earlier about you know some of our offices. You know, so we have water. I'll say I'll call it this way: water offices located in every state in the country. So you have access to a, a local office who work in the in the water arena, and and in the same vein as that, they also have the ability to cost share on water related projects. And so that's a, probably a really good example. Um, one of my uh, preferences would be, w is that ability for us to cost share would be increased. Uh, it's been kind of a limited program. So it's not, um, there's typically more um, municipalities, state agencies that would like to cost share with us than we have the ability. We just basically run out of money each year in those situations. But for, for non-taxable entities, so you know, states, counties, cities, NGOs, we have the ability to cost share on water related projects that would serve your needs as well as as long as they meet certain you know USGS requirements to meet our mission to provide science that, and information that will also provide you know value to society as a whole so we can meet, we can meet those pretty low that's a pretty low bar honestly in most cases but we have the ability again to do those cost share agreements and ideally it's a win win you get the information you need for your specific case and we're able to take that and maybe spread that around a little more, extrapolate it to other parts of the state or other parts of the country. So there's value in us doing that work because we can share that information to others in other locations. So, so that's a real obvious example. And again, we have offices in every state in the country. Um, they're, they're called water science centers. So those are our water offices. We also have other, you know, our mapping groups and our, our biology groups. They're a little more geographically located across regional boundaries or watershed boundaries. But again, we have that, uh, we have that same ability. Um, and those other programs don't have the cost share type approach that we have in water. And that's just kind of a historic thing because kind of back to flooding and the, the importance of that local information for water data, whether it's riverine, groundwater, um, you know, basically just water availability. That's really a local regional need because it varies so much across the country. And because of that, that's why that water co-op program came into play because we're able to meet the needs of the locals while at the same time helping to expand that you know, nationally. So I think that's, that's probably the best place to engage our folks at that level to get the information you're looking for, but also understand that the work we do is, again, nationally. We're able to make those national comparisons. That's what we do from our national programs, is take everything we're doing locally and regionally and we're able to make those comparisons. We can, you know, the, the data we collect, we do the same exact thing in Southern California as we would in upstate New York and Florida to Washington, Hawaii, Alaska. The processes we use are the same, which makes all those data comparable. And when you start thinking about things like climate change, that gives us a really strong baseline data set to use to start to predict and understand and look at changes and trends and, and all those types of things that are important, again, to help informing future efforts. Thank you, John. Uh, and, and Evie, uh, some examples of, of hurdles or things that you wish were, were different or could be different in future. Sure. Um, 
one hurdle, capacity. It's just Alex and me in the office. We have an amazing graduate student intern this summer, but we're just two people. But I'll note that's also a better opportunity for us to really intentionally partner with the community and with other folks in the space. Um, it's also great to be here in Chicago today in the state of Illinois, hear about CJA. There are so many supportive state policies and funding opportunities here that are not available in Indiana. Um, community solar, I mentioned that metering is expiring. Um, there was a state bill that we heard about these awesome EV charging stations in Madison's uh, new fleet center building. If uh, we have a facility that has solar on it, we're not allowed to charge now by the kilowatt hour for that EV station. A law was passed this spring. So working around a lot of the legislative um, limitations for our goals and on that note to aligning our goals with the utilities goals. So trying to um, become carbon neutral by 2050 will not be able to be done by us alone. It really does depend on our power sources. Um, and then just internally at the city, breaking away from the status quo and what is the cheapest option and trying to have that longer term um, planning and risk assessment mindset, bringing this into every decision that we make. We heard uh, the, mon the moderator for public health talk about public health should be in every policy, same with sustainability. We're trying to make that the status quo across the city in every decision. Um, and then again, sustainable financing. So right now we're try trying to spur investment, but long-term um, when these ARP dollars and infrastructure money goes away, how do these initiatives fund themselves? Great. Uh, that, that was a great summary of, you know, a, a range of hurdles from kind of consistent or desirable um, future states, like consistency in policy may, may be at state level or federal level, the ability to work with private sector like insurance or utilities with that shared vision, uh, and maybe above all, uh, the ability to maintain that long view um, and keep the community engaged, uh, although these projects do take a long time. So I know we're up at time, uh, so I want to thank all of our panelists uh, for uh, their very thoughtful responses and uh, sharing their successes uh, as, well as, uh, as well as hurdles so we can all learn from that. So we are all available during the networking uh, hour or, or lunch if you have questions. Uh, or please, uh, you know, work through Ken or Colin to to get in touch with us. So that uh, concludes our climate resilience panel. Thank you very much. <laughs>